Good morning. It's great to see all you all here. It's great to be here this morning. I don't think there's a better place we could be. I have a, a bit of a relationship with Planet Fitness. Um, so before I went into ministry, I actually, as a job, did electrical architectural drawings. And I used to design electrical drawings for Planet Fitness. So I have a little bit of loyalty to them that I think many people don't have. Um, even now, I still have a membership, partially because it's cheap, but um, I enjoy it. I enjoy going to the gym. The thing is, I don't go enough to really see results. Um, I, I like going, I go sometimes, and when I do go, I think I work pretty hard, but I'm not consistent enough with it to truly to gain the strength and to gain the, the, the muscle mass that I'm looking to gain. Um, and I think in many ways, sometimes our faith can be similar. Uh, sometimes we need to, to have a better understanding of what it takes to grow our faith. Because growth in faith doesn't just happen. Uh, it has to be developed. It has to be built up. It has to, um, it's something that, like any skill, has to be practiced and honed. Um, just like we have to study to gain knowledge, just like we have to work hard to gain weight or to gain muscle mass, um, we have to work to intentionally grow our faith. This morning, we're going to look at three incidents on the Sea of Galilee, uh, three different times that Jesus speaks to his apostles on the Sea of Galilee, and we're going to see how their faith grows in every instance. And we're going to take a lot of what we learn and what we observe in the apostles, and we're going to try to apply that to ourselves as we discuss how to grow in our faith. So that, that's our goal for this morning. Uh, the first incident, the first uh, time on the Sea of Galilee we're going to look at is in Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 through 27. There's a parallel account to this in Mark 4, uh, and we're going to jump there for one little thing, but primarily we're going to be in Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 through 27 for this first part. So starting in verse 23, when Jesus got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being covered with waves. But Jesus himself was asleep. And they came to him and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, for we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, you men of little faith? He got out, he rebuked the winds and the sea, and it became perfectly calm. And the men were amazed and said, What kind of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? All right. So just taking a look at this, this incident uh, from a large perspective, we see that Jesus is on the Sea of Galilee with his apostles during the storm. And we understand that Peter, Andrew, James, and John were all fishermen who spent a lot of their lives on boats on the Sea of Galilee fishing. So when, when this account tells us that this storm was so great that these seasoned fishermen are fearing for their lives, we need to understand that this is a big storm. The danger is imminent, and they do, and really are, fearful for their lives. And they have good reason to be, because these are the men that know the difference between a storm and something that can kill them. So the, the stakes are high. The stakes are real. And so that's what we see. The storm is great. They fear for their lives. And then in verse 25, we kind of see the, the beginnings of their faith, because the disciples wake up Jesus. But they wake up Jesus with this expectation that he can do something about it. They say, save us, Lord. We are perishing. Why do they go to Jesus? Because they expect Jesus to be able to do something. They have faith. They have some amount of faith in this account, and they expect Jesus to do something. Um, but verse 26, Jesus says, uh, Why are you afraid, you men of little faith? So despite what I would call at least some faith, it's, it's not enough. Their faith is not enough at this instance, and Jesus expects more from them. And so Jesus uh, calms the storm, rebukes the disciples, and uh, in verse 27, we see the disciples' response. And in this case, we see that they are amazed. If you look at the Mark passage that I mentioned, it says that they are greatly feared. So we see two responses from the, the apostles at, at, at large. We see that they are fearful and that they are amazed. And the fear, I think, makes sense if you look at the account and you understand that this is early in Jesus' ministry. Um, the, the apostles have been around Jesus, but for the most part, we understand that they've seen Jesus do heal people, 
and do little miracles. But this, I mean, just from a, a, a scope, the storm that was going to kill them all is calmed in an instant. I don't think they've seen Jesus exhibit this amount of power that, like that, like that before. And so they're, they're fearful, and that makes sense to us. And they are amazed. They say to themselves, what kind of man is this? that even the winds and the sea obey him. So we see, ultimately, they don't understand who Jesus is yet. And because they don't understand who Jesus is yet, they don't respond like they should. So we take a step back and we look at the faith of the apostles in this moment, and we see that it's, it, it exists. These are men who have already quit their jobs to follow Jesus. We see that it exists because these are men who go to Jesus with the expectation that Jesus can save. But it's not enough. They don't understand who Jesus is. They don't respond to who Jesus is. They need a greater faith. And that's our first instance, first incident. Let's go to our second incident, which is going to be in Matthew 14. Matthew 14, verses 22 through 33. Um, 22 through 33, starting in verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side, while he spent the crowds away. And after a while he had sent the crowds away, he went up to the mountain to pray by himself. And when it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and they said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, then command me to come onto the water. And he said, come. And Peter got out of, out of the boat and walked on the water and came towards Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened. He began to sink and he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand, took hold of him and said to him, you of little faith, why do you doubt? And when he got into the boat, the wind stopped and those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, You certainly are the Son of God. Okay, so second incident, we look at it broadly, and we see this is not a storm like we saw in Matthew chapter 8. Uh, this is a contrary wind. So the boat's trying to get across the Sea of Galilee, but the waves and the tide are coming against it, so it can't go forward. It can't go forward easily. It has to zigzag, and it's having trouble because there's choppy waves. And so it's, it's not great conditions, but it's not a storm that's going to, to kill them all or anything like that. Um, but we see that it's enough to make Peter fearful once he's in the water. So it, it's rough, but it's not the same amount of danger that we had previously seen. Um, in, in this passage, I think we look at the faith of Peter, and we kind of use him as a gauge of the rest of the apostles. So in verses 20, 28 and 29, we see the great faith of Peter. In this moment, Peter believes in the power of Jesus so much that he is willing to break the laws of physics. He says, Lord, by your power, I will do what is impossible. I will walk on this water to you, showing a great amount of faith. I think at this point, Peter has a greater amount of faith than I have. Just to throw that out there. Peter's faith in this moment is great. And so he does. He steps out of the boat, and he walks on water, but then verse 30, we see Peter sink. His faith is overcome by the, the waves, overcome by the distractions, overcome by the, the, the possibility of bad things happening to himself, and he loses focus of Jesus. His faith breaks, and so he sinks. Um, his faith is overcome when he loses focus on Jesus. Verses 31 and 32, we see, again, uh, Jesus' response. Jesus saves Peter. He pulls him up out of the waves, and he says, You of little faith, why did you doubt? This man who had previously walked on water now has faith so little that Jesus, Jesus rebukes him for it. He says, You need a greater faith. And so that, that's what happens. And in verse 33, uh, they get back onto the boat. The wind stops, and we see the response of the apostles as a whole. We see that now they have no fear. Uh, they now understand who Jesus is. They call him uh, God's son. He is certainly God's son, and they worship him. So they've grown. 
uh, when previously they didn't understand who Jesus was and they didn't understand how to respond. Now they know Jesus is the Son of God and we worship him in response. Their faith is growing. But once again, when we look at their faith in this incident, we see uh, it's not enough. Jesus expects his apostles, his disciples, to have a greater faith than even this. Their faith is growing for sure. We see their growth by what we read. But their faith is not enough. Their faith needs to continue to develop. That leads us to a third incident. Oh, formatting. That leads us to a third incident. Uh, turn with me to John 21. John 21, verses 1 through 19. We're not going to read all of this. We're going to focus in on one little part of this passage. But just in summary, we see in the first six verses that this is after Jesus has died and after Jesus has resurrected. We know that Jesus has already appeared to his apostles. They already know Jesus is alive again. And yet, in this passage, we see Simon Peter um, quit and go back to fishing. His faith isn't great. It's not in a great spot. And he takes along other apostles with him. Uh, Simon Peter knows Jesus is alive again, but Simon Peter goes and returns to fishing, and he takes others with him. In verses 1 through 6, we see Jesus appear to them, and Jesus gives them the great big catch of fish. Uh, verses 7 through, through 11, we see uh, Jesus reveals himself, and Peter is so eager to get to Jesus, once he knows Jesus is there, he jumps out of the boat and he swims to Jesus. I, I would argue this isn't so much him showing faith, as this is him showing um, eagerness, maybe. Not so much faith, but eagerness. Peter greatly wants to be with Jesus. And then uh, what I want to focus in on is verses 15 through 17. Verses 15 through 17. Um, this is a slightly, not, not complicated, but in this passage we have the word love used repeatedly. And I don't think we as, as American English-speaking Christians understand the, the, the true context for this word sometimes. Like, I will say, uh, I love candy. I love it. That's my weakness. But I'll also say, I love Sarah and I love Jasper. And we, we understand that's not the same kind of love. I, li I love candy. I love my wife and my kid. But I love one a lot more than I love the other. Yet we have one word. One word, love, describes both things, even though the meaning is different. In Greek, we have lots of different words for love. And in this passage, we have two different words that are both translated love. We have uh, this word agape and this word uh, phileo. Um, agape is this idea of a, like the greatest form of love, a sacrificial love in which you will uh, do anything for the sake of the one you love. So it's like the greatest form of love. And then we have phileo, which is uh, brotherly love. Like we have the city of Philadelphia, which is the city of brotherly love. So it's still love. It's the love you might have for a friend, but just by the definition, we have agape as the greater love and phileo as the lesser love in some ways. And so as we, read, we, as we read this passage, I just kind of stuck in the, the translations for the words as we read. So, so read with me, starting in verse 15. And I'm going to just kind of plug in the right word for love. And so when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you agape love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo love you. And he said to him, then tend my lambs. And Jesus said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you agape love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo love you. And he said to him, then shepherd my sheep. And Jesus said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you phileo love me? And Peter was grieved because he had said to him this third time, do you phileo love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I phileo love you. Then Jesus said, tend my sheep. We see the pattern here. Jesus says, do you agape love me? Do you love me to the greatest degree? And, and Peter says, no, I love you, but not to that greatest degree. And then J Jesus says it again. And then Jesus says it a third time, but the third time, Jesus kind of lowers his, his, his standard, and he says, um, do you phileo love me? And this grieves Peter. Um, he is grieved to hear this this third time, um, because ultimately Jesus is saying, uh, I have a greater expectation for you. I expect more out of you than what you can give at this time. 
um, and it grieves Peter. Um, it's also probably pointing back to how just days previously, Peter had denied Jesus three times at the crucifixion. Uh, G- uh, Peter's weakest moment of faith. And so here in this third incident on the Sea of Galilee, we kind of see the apostles at a low. We've been growing in faith this whole time, but now all of a sudden their faith is not where it should be, and it should be higher. Jesus still expects more from his apostles. These are men who, had, who know that Jesus has been resurrected, but they went back to fishing. This is a man who had just previously denied Jesus three times and just completely denied his faith. And now Jesus is saying, I expect more from you. And um, we, we continue reading verses 18 and 19, and it kind of tells us a little bit more. Jesus continues to speak to Peter, and he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands, and somebody else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now, when he said this, he signified what kind of death he would glorify God. For when he had spoken this, he said to him, Follow me. So now, just after Jesus had said, I expect you to have a greater love for me, Jesus is saying, and you will. Jesus is prophesying or predicting, eventually Peter's going to die for the sake of Jesus. While previously, Peter denied Jesus to save his own life, now Jesus is saying, your faith will grow and your love for me will grow until you get to the point where you will die a martyr's death for my sake. And we find that this is going to be true. Um, We find that even now, Jesus expects his apostles to have a greater faith. Even now, at the end of Jesus' entire ministry, there's not that much time left with Jesus, but Jesus still expects them to grow. Um, Jesus wants them to have a greater faith. And their faith is this continuous process that, that builds, that sometimes shrinks, but that continually grows. And we know that it will continue to grow throughout the rest of the Bible, throughout the rest of the book of Acts, and throughout the, the letters that we read, the epistles. Uh, we see in the book of Acts that James that, not James, that Peter and John are going to be so bold that they will speak boldly of Jesus' death in, in Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 4, in Acts chapter 5, even when they are threatened and told to stop. They will not stop, and they will stand boldly for Christ. We see that throughout the rest of the book of Acts as they face persecutions. We see the faith of the apostles continue to grow. When we read uh, Peter's epistles, uh, First and Second Peter, we read about the persecutions that Peter is facing, and about how he does not deny Christ. His faith grows and continues to grow throughout the rest of the Bible. And all of this leads us to to what really might be our important question. Um, The disciples had this this journey of faith. They started with some faith. They continued to grow in faith throughout Jesus' entire ministry. And we see in those three incidents on the Sea of Galilee that it grows and that it continues to grow. But the important question we now must ask ourselves is, well, why? How did the apostles grow their faith? Um, I don't mean to suggest that this is an inclusive list of all of the ways that the apostles grew their faith, but here are maybe three ways, three possibilities, three, three ways that the apostles grew their faith. One, we got to consider that their faith was built by their time listening to Jesus's teachings. They had spent three years with Jesus hearing all that he had to say. These are men who were present at the Sermon on the Mount, These are men who were present at the Sermon on the Plains. These are men who were present when Jesus spoke to the Pharisees, when Jesus spoke in the temple. They heard what Jesus had to say, and that is a faith-building thing. The more they listened to Jesus' teachings, the more they grew. Um, And often, we grow in faith by listening to Jesus. Uh, Second way that they might have grown in faith, that they did grow in faith, is by their experiences. Three years they spent with Jesus, seeing his miracles. Three years they spent with Jesus seeing these faith-affirming things happen. Three years they spent with Jesus not only watching those miracles happen, but they participated. These are men who were given the ability to heal also. Uh, We know that Jesus sent them out in groups of two. We see that in the limited commission in Mark chapter 6. So they weren't only with Jesus. They also went went out on their own preaching Jesus and preaching the gospel to other people. And all of these things are faith-building experiences. How did they grow in their faith? They grew in their faith by going and doing the will of God. Um, And we see that they grow in their faith as they learn to rely on the Lord instead of themselves. 
We see that in Acts, after Jesus ascends and after they face persecutions, they learn to rely on God far above how they rely on themselves. They learn to rely on God when they're tested, and as they do so, their faith grows. As they are tested, as they are persecuted, they persevere, and as they persevere, their faith continues to grow. So their growth in faith was a process, but we see the things that they did to grow their faith. And now we ask ourselves, what about us? Um, they grew their faith by spending time with the Lord, by serving the Lord, and by relying on the Lord. We grow our faith in the exact same ways. How do we grow our faith in the exact same ways? We grow our faith through study of God's teachings. The, the, the apostles spent three years with Jesus hearing what he had to say. And we don't have that privilege. We don't get to literally speak with Jesus. But we have the words that God has given us, the, word that Jesus, the words that Jesus has spoke, and we have that access to his words just the same as they did. We have our access to the Bible. John, John 8, 31 and 32 reads, If you continue in my word, then you are truly a disciple of mine. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. God has given us everything we need to be his disciple. He has given us everything that he wants us to know. Uh, we read in 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, uh, we know that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And we, know that he, and we know that he hears us. Whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of him. So we have this avenue of communication with God, not the same way that the apostles did, but maybe in an even better way. We pray to God and God hears us. We read God's word and God speaks to us. We have communication to God and by being people of the scripture, we can grow our faith. In the same way as the apostles grew their faith, by listening to Jesus, we grow our faith by listening to Jesus. A second way we might grow our faith is through our own experiences, through our positive experiences serving the church and doing God's will. Um, we know that the apostles grew from their experiences as they went and they served, as they, as they worked for God. Um, and we do the same things. There's many things that we do to serve the Lord that grow our faith as we serve. Have you ever taught a Bible class? If you've ever taught a Bible class, you know the preparation it takes to, to do that builds you up more than anybody in your class ever will. It's a faith-building exercise. Have you ever um, gone on a mission trip? Have you ever done a short-term mission trip or, or even just gone to volunteer at a place? If you've done this, you know going and serving is a faith-building experience that edifies you, that builds up your faith. Um, have you done a personal study? Have you, done, um, have you spoke to people about your faith? These are faith-building things for you as well as others. Even coming to church and being a part of this worship service, worshiping God, is a faith-building exercise that helps you grow in your faith. We grow in faith by our experiences. Um, but also, we grow in our faith in our bad experiences. When we face difficult circumstances, but rely on God to get us through those things, we learn that we can rely on God to get us through anything. We rely on God through our bad experiences, and that grows our faith, just like it did for the apostles. Um, the apostles grew on their faith as they relied on God through their persecutions. Bad things happen to us all the time. Uh, we speak to people, and our faith is challenged. Um, we, we, we watch a TV show that mocks our faith, and our faith is challenged. Uh, bad things just happen to us in general. Uh, we get sick. We get hurt. We face pain in this world. And when we do, are we going to rely on God to get us through these things? Are we going to, to study God's word to, to strengthen our faith in these situations? If we do, we strengthen our faith. God can strengthen us. Our faith can be strengthened through the bad experiences that we have as well as the good experiences that we have. And that is a truth. That, that was true for the apostles. It could be true for us. I think one last point to, to, to consider is that we grow our faith on an individual basis. That was true of the apostles, was it not? Consider Judas. Judas was with the rest of the apostles for the three years of Jesus' ministry. He heard the same lessons. He heard the same teachings that Jesus gave everybody else. He had the same experiences, the same miracles being performed. 
He went out on his own to have those own positive experiences. And yet his faith didn't develop. His faith was so weak, he betrayed Jesus for money. Just because he was around Jesus does not, did not make his faith grow. Um, his faith was not equal to the rest of the apostles' faith, and that's going to be true for us as well. Your faith is not the same as the faith of your family. Your faith is not the same as the preacher. Your faith is not the same as anybody else in this congregation. Your faith is your individual faith. And you face the responsibility to make sure your individual faith grows. Um, don't be like Judas. You can be around the church your whole life and not grow your faith. You have to take steps to intentionally grow your faith. Faith and growth, growth in faith is a process. You have to choose to grow your faith. And it takes active steps to grow. Like the apostles, we are called to continually strive for a greater faith. There's no such thing as a good enough faith. We never reach that point where our faith is good enough and we can settle. Um, can, we looked at Peter's journey. We looked at Peter's journey in faith, and we saw he started with a great amount of faith. Even from the very beginning, he quit his job to follow Jesus for three years. Um, but that amount of faith was not enough. We saw him walk on water. We saw him uh, do all of these great things, and yet his faith was still not enough. Peter saw the resurrected Lord and continued to serve for the rest of his life, and yet his amount of faith was not enough. Um, and this leads us to a realization that no matter what, no amount of faith is enough. And that's because we are saved by God's grace. God's grace makes up the difference when our faith is not enough. Um, we cannot survive. We cannot live by, on, by faith alone. We can never serve well enough or have enough belief to get us into heaven. It is by God's grace, by Jesus' sacrifice, that we are made good enough. We grow in faith. We never become stagnant. But we are called to continue to grow. And God's grace saves us when our faith wanes. So now i got to ask you, do you feel like your faith is less than it should be? Do you feel like you need to continue to grow in faith, that, or do you feel like you've become stagnant? Um, have you stopped trying to pursue that deeper faith that God wants you to try to gain? Uh, you, can, you can take this opportunity now to, to start your journey of faith. If you haven't been baptized, then God's grace is not going to make up that difference. Uh, if you have need, then this is the perfect opportunity to do whatever you need to get your life back on track. If that means uh, being baptized and starting your journey of faith, if that means rededicating your faith, if that means uh, just seeking the prayers of the church, this is an opportunity to do so. Uh, please continue to remember, your, your faith is a journey. You are called to grow, and God wants you to continue to grow in your faith. If you have any need, please come forward now as we stand and as we sing.